Undeceptions Podcast. Hey, John Dixon here. Many of you know that in June 2021, my best mate of 40 plus years, Ben Shaw, died in our home in Sydney, surrounded by his loved ones. But not before he finished his wonderful book, Seven Reasons to Reconsider Christianity. It's a unique blend of humour and thoughtfulness designed to explain the heart of the Christian faith for those who aren't sure what to make of it. His publisher invited me to do the voice record for the audiobook, which was a lot of fun. And they've given us permission to offer Undeceptions listeners a taste of the book over the next few weeks in the lead up to season 10. So here's a bit of Ben Shaw's Seven Reasons to Reconsider Christianity. I'm sure most of us, at one stage or another, have unknowingly misheard the lyrics of a famous song, and as a result, we've been singing the wrong words for years. Apparently, many people still mistakenly sing along to the eurythmic song, Sweet Dreams, swapping the line, Sweet dreams are made of these, for Sweet dreams are made of cheese, which is actually better, I reckon. I'm totally convinced that many people reject Christianity because they've been singing the wrong lyrics to the song of Christianity. They've misheard that Christianity is all about following a set of rules, living a restrictive moral life, going to a boring church on Sunday, abstaining from all fun and praying to a distant God, and then finally heading off to a dreary, cloudy existence called heaven. Basically, people have it in their heads that Christianity is not about life, but the end of it. So why have so many people misheard the lyrics of Christianity? Well, sometimes it's due to the performance of the church. Sadly, in far too many cases, it's Christians themselves who have performed the song of Christianity badly, and so have distorted the true lyric of what Jesus actually said and did. In other cases, people claiming to be Christians have actually deliberately changed, twisted or bent the lyrics to suit their own purposes. Others have misheard the lyrics of the Christian song due to well-meaning but misinformed artists, filmmakers and creatives. In a similar way, many of us misunderstand the lyrics of Christianity because our own hearing is selective. We only half listen to the words. As a result, many of us only hear a small part of the Christian song at Christmas, Easter, weddings or funerals. But even then, it's only on in the background, so to speak. We're not fully engaged with it. We only hear a small part of the song and dismiss the whole thing on those grounds. That was certainly the case for me growing up in a non-churchgoing family in Sydney, Australia. Turns out, like many people, I had completely misheard the lyrics. One of the main lyrics of Christianity, which I discovered to my surprise later in life, is that it's all about living life to the fullest. Yes, you heard that right. Jesus sang that on many occasions in multiple ways. He proclaimed that he had come to give us life real, spine-tingling, soul-satisfying life. Life to the full. John chapter 10, verse 1. He claimed that he had come into this world to bring us happiness, fulfillment, joy, meaning, community, purpose, love, hope, and more for all eternity. I want to lay out three lyrics of Christianity that you may have been mishearing and that I'd love you to consider afresh. The first word is God. What do you think of when you hear that word? 
For many of us, God, if he's there, is not really someone we relate to or would want to hang out with. Most of my friends love going to the pub, watching engaging TV and playing sport. They enjoy fine wine, holidays in Europe and going to gigs to see their favourite bands. They love sitting on beaches, watching sunsets or having a meal at their favourite restaurant. For them, all this has virtually nothing to do with God and Christianity. They think God is only interested in stained glass windows, prayer and you being on your best behaviour. In their minds, God has no interest in films, beaches, cooking, modern music or a good Cabernet Sauvignon. He's just into spiritual things and being boring. And the only things on his playlists are old hymns and organ music. However, they've drastically misheard the lyric of God in the Christian song. He's actually into the very things we love and enjoy way more than what we may realise. One of the best known yet paradoxically most forgotten verses of the Bible when it comes to God is the first one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 verse 1. Think about that for a moment. Christianity states from its opening line that God made the world the planet that we so love and enjoy. That verse isn't just an introduction to the Bible, it's an introduction to God. It tells us that he's into stuff, that he is behind the very things we get a kick out of. God created tropical beaches, coral reefs, alpine meadows and snowfields where we can ski. From stars to butterflies, from Everest to the Great Barrier Reef, from the Grand Canyon to the French Alps, God made and gave us all of this. Moreover, he made us. He created us with the ability to laugh, make friends and fall in love. He designed us with the skills and imagination to create works of art, to write plays, songs and poems, to design cities and to invent technologies. It seems that many of us, including me, are or have been singing the wrong lyrics about God. It's not that he's solely into spiritual things and only wants us to be on our best behaviour all the time. He created this world and all the beautiful things we love and enjoy to give us a full, blessed life. He gave us the ability to laugh and cry and love. He made us get goosebumps when we hear a great symphony or see an amazing sunset. He gave us taste buds to enjoy tasty food and good coffee. He's not a killjoy or a boring, draconian old man. He gives us great things to enjoy and cares for us. Another word, lyric, that I'd love you to reconsider is the name Jesus. What comes to mind when you hear that name? In addition to Renaissance art and Easter movies, I can remember that one of the earliest impressions I got of Jesus came from a children's picture Bible. Whenever I heard the name Jesus, I'd think of a number of pictures from this children's Bible, and one in particular. It was a pastel watercolour picture of Jesus sitting on a rock in the middle of a flowery meadow, surrounded by daisies, squirrels, robins, and a couple of lambs. At his feet sat a ring of small, immaculately dressed children, all looking intently at Jesus. Basically, Jesus looked like a male version of Maria von Trapp out of The Sound of Music. I don't know what image comes to your mind when you think of Jesus. For many people, he's a bit like what I've just described, a Disney cartoon character or a strange tree-hugging hippie from the 1960s or some kind of moral crusader. To be fair, some of my non-church-going friends give Jesus a bit more credit than that. For them, he is a philosopher guru, a kind of blend between Gandhi and the Dalai Lama. But for most of them, as far as real life in the 21st century goes, Jesus is totally irrelevant. 
But I would love to suggest again that many of us have misheard the lyric of Jesus and what he was really all about. Take, for example, the first miracle Jesus performed when he turned water into wine. For starters, it's worth pointing out that Jesus turned water into wine, not the other way around. He didn't take something good that we enjoy and turn it into something plain and boring. He took water out of six huge ceremonial washing jars and turned it into wine for enjoyment. And not just any wine, really good wine. Furthermore, he did it at a wedding party in order to keep the party going. Jesus wasn't the party pooper I long thought he was. Turns out, he was the party starter. The book's author, John, points out that this was Jesus' first miracle, which prompts a question. Why did Jesus launch his ministry with a miracle at a party? Well, because it was a brilliant, vivid picture of what his ministry and the kingdom of God were all about. His kingdom, the place where he hangs out, is full of life, fun, happiness and joy. He was teaching everyone there that he had come to invite people to a party. Later he would go on to say on several occasions that the kingdom of God is like a royal wedding feast and that we're all invited. To show us what the party was going to be like, he went on to heal people from all sorts of illnesses and diseases, giving them their dignity again as he restored them to health. He sat and dined with prostitutes, outcasts and the irreligious, giving them hope and offering forgiveness. He plugged people back into their communities and back into God. He gave people meaning and purpose as he taught about life life to the fullest. The final lyric I'd love you to hear afresh is the word heaven. Most of my non-church-going friends would say they picture heaven as people walking around in long white nightgowns, floating on fluffy clouds and listening to dated choral music like you might get in a department store elevator. They picture a place of ethereal tranquility that looks relaxing, but in the end is pretty boring. That's certainly how I used to picture it. But yet again, I'd been singing the wrong lyric. Perhaps the closest thing we have to a brochure on heaven is found in the last few chapters of the Bible in the book of Revelation. In symbolic picture language, the author, again the Apostle John, describes a vision in which he was taken on a tour of the afterlife by some angelic guide and given a glimpse of what life would look like for God's people for eternity. Here's part of the original lyric. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, for the old order of things has passed away. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. (music) 
sometimes this description reads a bit more like something that Tolkien or C.S. Lewis would have written, but it's easy to get the gist of it. The first thing to notice here is that there's no mention of choral music, fluffy clouds, unicorns, nightgowns, or harps and halos. Most importantly, there's absolutely no indication whatsoever of this place being dull or boring. The other thing not to miss is that the next life, or heaven as we might call it, is physical. The Bible, both here and elsewhere, speaks of eternal life for God's people on a new earth. The next world will be exactly that, a world. Presumably then, it will be a place where we will play, walk, run, swim, eat, drink, and live life to the fullest. A physical place where there are trees, rivers, skies, heavens, and so on. That said, you might have noticed that John says that there was no longer any sea. For many years, I thought this sounded pretty disappointing until I discovered that the sea represented chaos and instability to the ancient reader. It's therefore not saying that in the next life there'll be no bodies of water, but that there will no longer be any turmoil, chaos and disorder. John gets a glimpse of how God and people are meant to be, with no tears or pain or suffering anymore. All those things that make us sad, angry or anxious, gone. No more crime, poverty, greed or family breakups. Disease and death will become things of the past. This whole vision is meant to tell us that life with God is going to be the best time ever. It will be the life to the full that Jesus talked about for all eternity. The very opposite of what many of us have been hearing. So maybe for years, you've misheard the original lyric of Christianity. In your mind, the song of Christianity was always about rules, religiosity, and a life of perpetual boredom. I hope by now you've heard at least some of the lyrics afresh. But please, keep listening. There's so much more to hear. Christianity is not about the suppression of life, but about embracing it. It's about the very things we all long for. Hope, joy, love, meaning, safety, fulfillment, and happiness. Because when we stop to consider the original lyrics, we find that Jesus' life, teaching, and ministry overflowed with those very things. I hope you liked this taste of Ben Shaw's Seven Reasons to Reconsider Christianity, published by the Good Book Company, available everywhere. We'll give you some more of these over the next few weeks, and before you know it, we'll be back with Undeceptions Season 10. See ya. Podcast.